we're not able to conclude any to any substantive degree that an incident that is consistent with the facts contained in that article occurred at the Phi Kappa Psi fraternity house or any other fraternity house for that matter. And with that, Tim Longo, Sheridsville Police Chief, pretty much dismissed the allegations that were made in Rolling Stone about a uh, alleged gang rape that happened at the University of Virginia campus. Joining us right now, T. Reese Shapiro of the Washington Post, uh, one of the reporters, the education reporter to be specific, but he was one of the reporters who did a lot of fact-checking on that Rolling Stone article and helped, uh, well, really uh, call into question the validity of those allegations. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you. So, I, listen, the police chief went on to say very specifically that uh, his announcement yesterday doesn't mean that something didn't happen to the woman who's known as Jackie. It's just that they don't have evidence that uh, the things that occurred in that article happened. Based on your reporting now, th- what, what are we led to understand about what happened that night, if anything happened that night? I think what yesterday's announcement was able to show uh, is that police chief Timothy Longo said that with all the resources available to him, um, you know, they interviewed 70 people. They spent hundreds of man hours investigating the case. And as far as they were able to determine, there is no evidence to prove uh, that to to substantiate any of the allegations that uh, were published in the Rolling Stone account. Let me play... Yes. Oh, let me play for you one more moment uh, there that I think raised a lot of eyebrows from the press conference, and I'd love for you to respond to it. Here's, uh, again, uh, Police Chief Longo. The last contact we had with her was on December 10th, and we were very distinctly and succinctly told that she would not talk to us, that she would not file a report, that she did not want to investigate, and that we were not to talk to her again. So. That's I, I think most people will be very surprised to hear that the alleged victim of this rape uh, have not has not talked to the police since the 10th and refuses to talk to the police. Based on your reporting down there in Charlottesville, uh, is it your understanding that she is kind of keeping to herself? Or I, my understanding is that, and I've read somewhere, that she's actually quite active on campus and she continues to tell her story and be active with uh, various uh, uh, groups in uh, on campus. So, so. Is that the fact? And if so, why is she talking to these activist groups and not talking to the police? Sure. Well, I, I met Jackie twice in person, and she and I spoke on the phone multiple times. Um, and I always, I, she's a very intelligent girl, uh, obviously. She's a UVA student. Uh, but she told me in interviews that she knew or that she, she felt that she knew that police involvement wouldn't lead to any charges in her case. She said that she was aware that that she lacks any forensic evidence to prove her claims. So as far as, you know, her desire to pursue, you know, the criminal justice system and the police, maybe she's just not comfortable with that. Maybe that's why she's not wanting to speak with police. As far as her involvement on campus with student groups, I'm not, you know, I, I haven't had any contact with her either. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, it appears that something did happen to her. I mean, we, we know that she had an abrasion on her face. But but when you when you take the evidence that is available to police and they go through, it's 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 sort of like, you know, what happened in Ferguson. When you go through and you look at the forensic evidence in the case, it doesn't match up to what was alleged to have happened. So what what are we to believe happened to this woman? It's it's not clear. Uh, Well, I spoke also to three students who came to Jackie's aid in the immediate aftermath of that evening on September 28, 2012. And they all told me that she was extremely distraught, uh, very emotional, uh, but did, she did not appear physically injured in any way. She was not wounded or bloodied, uh, as was portrayed in Rolling Stone. Uh, but at the same time, all of them said that the way that she was acting would appear consistent with some sort of sexual assault. And she told them at the time that she'd been, that she'd just suffered a sexual assault. But what she described was materially different from what was published in Rolling Stone. So again, all, all I think we're able to say at this point is it's very clear that what was published in Rolling Stone uh, has been proven by the police not to have occurred. Oh, and, and to that end, let's shift our focus from uh, Jackie and what may have happened that night or may not have happened that night. And let's turn to Rolling Stone. I mean, you, uh, like I, I mentioned, you uh, played a pretty big part, I think, and were cited. A lot of your reporting was cited in uh, revealing a lot of the inconsistencies in that story. Where is Rolling Stone on this now? My understanding is the story is still up on their website with just sort of a, a disclaimer uh, right before you start to read it. Uh, are they in big trouble? You know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, our goal as the Washington Post is always just to pursue the truth no matter where it leads, right? Um, uh, that was our goal from the very beginning, and it just so happened 
uh, that what ended up coming out is, is just that things aren't so clear. Uh, Columbia University is coming out with their report examining the, uh, the, the reporting process for the story. The, the Columbia Journalism School? I, I, yes. just, I just want to stop you because you just said here at the Washington Post we follow the facts and the truth wherever it may lead. That, that suggests, I think, by, or may, maybe I'm, I'm inferring it, that Rolling Stone didn't do that in this case. I think that the police report yesterday at least shows that. And and at this point, uh, my understanding is that the fraternity uh, down there at the University of Virginia, who was under fire and uh, in focus, and they had, I mean, all the fraternities were shut down for a little while there, they're now suing Rolling Stone. Is that your understanding? Uh, well, they they went through, you know, a significantly emotional period for them as well. They came to come to doubt themselves. Um, at least, you know, this, this, this story cast them in such negative light, they weren't sure what to, what to believe. Um, but now they, they released a statement yesterday that they're exploring their options. It's not clear if they've filed the lawsuit yet, but it's absolutely something that they are considering. Yeah, as a journalist who, who has had a sort of an interesting perspective on this particular story, I'm wondering, you know, what lessons do you do you draw from this whole experience? I mean, it seems like we've had a number of, of stories, high-profile stories across the country, where there is sort of a rush to conclusion, and everybody overreacts. And then as, they, as we start to get into it a little more, we find out, well, maybe that's not exactly the way it went down. I mean, it, it, do, you, do you have some concern that perhaps officials at UVA responded too quickly to believe the allegations without doing any kind of investigation? I'm not, you know, you know the UVA officials said yesterday, too, that they were aware of at least some of these claims before the Rolling Stone article came out. I think as, as journalists, all we're able to do is just to confirm, to trust but verify, obviously, when it comes to, you know, claims of sexual assault. I think, it, if anything, one big lesson that we've learned from that is that this issue is you know, it, it obviously is, is very uh, highly debated on campuses, and it's, it's something that people, if anything, it brought to light a lot of these issues that are very sensitive. And I think everybody agrees that one sexual assault on campus is too many. Yeah. Uh, so. wh- one other story, T. Reese Shapiro, that you've been following and we've been following, and that is of Martise Johnson, who uh, a week ago today, actually, on St. Patrick's evening, uh, was arrested by ABC agents. And, uh, of course, the video went viral. I, as, as this continues to be investigated, I've got one question. Maybe you know this and I don't. Has Have the ABC agents actually revealed to the media or to the public exactly what prompted their decision to tackle him from behind and push him to the ground, causing his face to be bloodied? Have they said this is what he did, and so that's why we did this? I don't think we I don't think we we yet have come to understand exactly what transpired that night. I think it's unclear what what happened the moment before the videos cut on. I think that eventually that may come out in court. I believe Martiz is due to appear before a judge on March 26th, and maybe some of that evidence may, pre- may be presented then. Wow, but, but with all the protests and all of the media sort of watching the story, you would think that the police would hold a press conference and say, listen, here's what happened, and here's what he did. You know, he tried to run or he tried to hit a cop or something, and that's why we had to tackle him. Students have come out with their own with their own version of events as what they said transpired. Uh, it's still not clear yet what the official perspective is. Wow. All right. All right. Listen. Thank you so much for joining us. And as that story develops, I'm sure maybe we'll uh, have you have back. Have you here. back. Right. All right. Thank you. T. Reese Shapiro, Washington Post, education reporter.